When you first apply power to a circuit, or there's any sort of interruption, like pressing a reset button, everything in the circuit has to establish itself. Chips power up and transistors transist. And it takes a second, well, a microsecond, for all of the electric fields to stabilize and establish themselves and everything to really get going. So there's a brief period at the very beginning of a circuit where you don't really want to rely on anything because everything's going haywire until it settles. But also, you might have to initialize something like a register. Quantum mechanical effects and whatnot, random noise, is going to cause stuff like a register, like flip-flops and latches, to initialize to a random state, or if not a random state, at least a garbage state. Like, you know, you have memory and you might want to zero it before using it, but maybe you don't care. If you write before you read, you don't care what was in there, but what if you had a shift register that you're using as a round robin activator or a frequency divider or something? You want that shift register to have a certain pattern in it that's not going to be built in by default, even if it's cleared. A chip is probably not going to clear itself on boot up. It could be engineered to do so, but you know, generally there's no reason to do that, and also cleared is not necessarily the right answer. So you might need a certain pattern in that shift register to have it go around and around with the clock signal, but you don't need to change it all the time. You can hook up a shift register to a microcontroller and change it all you want, and you can do that to initialize it too when the thing starts up. The microcontroller, which is specifically engineered to, you know, take power and start up properly, that one is programmed to be like start at zero and go down. So the microcontroller could initialize the shift register, but that takes pins, because then, you know, there's only so much engineering you can do to reuse pins on different parts because you need control to rewire switches and stuff. It's not like you can just, you know, have the pins flip as soon as you're done. And fancier things like your computer, there is a microcontroller in your computer that runs on boot up and boots up the main computer. But for a simple thing, you don't need that for a simple thing. You just want it to initialize. You want to clear the shift register or, or give it a pattern or you want to you know, wait a quarter of a second for everything to settle. You know, make sure make sure all of the power supply capacitors are stabilized. You know, you get a switching power supply, make sure it's all nice and flat. So you want to wait a quarter of a second at the start. So you want a boot up signal. You want something where you turn it on and everything settles and then there's a signal that says, okay, everything's good now. And you can use this signal to signal to a microcontroller it's ready to go if the microcontroller doesn't have a clock because the microcontroller could just wait. But you can also use this signal to turn on and off things like maybe you want to, you know, have a ding or something or power a sub circuit only during boot up or you want to configure your chip and then never again. So you can use this to set up your chips or set up anything you want at the beginning and then it turns itself off and it requires board space. It's engineering, but it does not require a microcontroller. And in order to support something like a reset button, you want it to be able to charge slowly and discharge quickly using an RC timer to do this signal. I've already done a video on doing so using a JFET, so go watch that video. I'm just going to show you the circuit here. I'm not going to go over the drain part. I'm going to go over the timer and charge part. So we assume a single-sided power supply, just a normal probably 5 volts or whatever. So here's our timer. The idea is we use the capacitance and resistance, RC time, in order to get a signal that's low and goes up to high so that at a certain point that signal like it's it's basically a digital signal that switches and when it switches you know you're done but this needs to charge slowly and drain quickly so we add that part so here's the discharge part that i went over in the other video just to summarize this is a depletion mode jfet or mosfet meaning that normally if you have nothing connected if it's completely unpowered or whatever then it's open it's basically a crappy wire and you have to apply a voltage from source to gate to turn it off. You have to apply a voltage to pinch it off. So when power is applied, you have, let's say, 5 volts here and 0 volts here, which is pinching off the JFET and the capacitor is not draining. In order to prevent it from charging, because this is supposed to do the timing, this is your charging. So in order to prevent the JFET or MOSFET backwards, generally the JFET, because that's the one that's bidirectional, the MOSFET might be fine, but a JFET is bidirectional, so it'll try and charge through, so we add a diode so that this does not charge the capacitor. And then when power is cut, 
So when you press the reset button, when you take out the batteries, unplug it, power goes out, whatever, then the, the power is gone here. There's no voltage across source gate. So the JFET just opens up as a crappy wire and it drains through this resistor, which is much smaller to allow it to drain quickly. So for example, you might have this charge over a half a second and this discharge over one or two milliseconds. So that, you know, you press the reset button and it drains in the time of that reset button. So then you get your whole boot up signal again, just from a quick press. Now, before we use the signal, let me quickly talk about how to choose your parts. So the first thing is when the power is on, this is draining power. This is wasting it. So you want to have a larger resistor to waste as little power as possible. And the beauty is you can make this capacitor smaller because the whole thing is you need it to drain quickly, but charge slowly. So you can have a small capacitor, a medium resistor and a large resistor to get a fast drain, slow charge. So the first thing is we decide how much power to lose. Let's say one milliwatt. I'll use the example I'm doing. So we say one milliwatt is how much power I'm willing to let be wasted. It's not that much. You could go lower. So we have power equals voltage times current and voltage equals current times resistance. So current equals power divided by voltage and resistance equals voltage divided by current. So we take our one milliwatt, we divide by our five volts and we get our current. Then we take our current divided into the five volts. Again, we get our resistance. And then when I round it off to a value that I have in my resistor box, I'm going to use about a 27 K ohm resistor there, which you're saying it's a drain resistor. That's huge, right? But we're using a tiny capacitor. So this is 27 K ohm. So it's going to drain about a milliwatt all the time that the power is on. That's fine. So then if we recall tau equals R times C, tau is like how much time it takes to charge 63, 67%, whatever it is, from empty to that much charge or from full to that much discharge. And if we do five times, that's about 98, 99%. So generally speaking, five times R times C is considered the standard measure for full charge from empty to full or from full to empty discharge. So if we have resistance and we have the time, let's say one millisecond, I want this to drain in about one millisecond. And we're ignoring the diode drop because this is approximate. The point is not to actually time it to the millisecond. The point is on the order of a millisecond, we say that's fast enough. So about a millisecond is fine. So we say about one millisecond and then that's five times tau. So five times tau is one millisecond. That's the full discharge time from full to empty of this capacitor. So we do one millisecond divided by five and then divided by the resistor equals the capacitance. So we divide by five, divide by resistance, we get capacitance. And then again, if I round off to a value that I have in my capacitor box using, you know, the nice little ceramics, you certainly don't need a big capacitor, get about 10 nano farad, which is still sizable in the grand scheme of the universe because like the, the parasitic capacitance and stuff in the breadboard is on the order of picofarads. So nano farads is still, you know, even on a breadboard is, is well within the range of actually doing something. So now it's going to drain from absolute full to pretty much empty in just over a millisecond, like 1.3 milliseconds. Cool. That's fine. Then I say, I would like to charge from empty to full in about one second. So again, we have five times R times C. So one second equals five times R times C, but this time we know the capacitance. So divide by five times the capacitance and we get the resistance. And that comes out to about 20 mega ohms, 20 mega ohms. And yes, there are reasons to use mega ohms. That's valid. They're in your box for a reason. We don't care about noise immunity. We don't care about frequency response. All we care about is letting current through at the correct rate. And mega ohms, it, it's, it's just physics. It'll go through. 10 nanofarads, you don't need that many electrons, so they'll go through. This is perfectly valid. So about 20 mega ohms will give us about one second full to empty, empty to full with this capacitor. It's not going to be one second once we get through with using the signal, but again, we're being rough. So 20 mega ohms. So that's how you decide on your values. You decide your waste power and calculate this resistor. Then you decide on your drain time, your discharge time and calculate the capacity. 
capacitor, then you decide on your charge time and calculate that resistor. And the diode JFET makes sure that only one is in use at a time. Nice and easy. So from empty to full, this is going to give us a curve like this. So the first issue is it's going to be a slow curve, and I also recently did a video about what happens when you are operating in the region of indeterminate voltage when applying to digital logic chips, and it may not give the result you want. So the first thing to do is sharpen this up. I want a nice square wave signal, like so. And at the same time, I'd like to have both high and low, because we may apply this to the bases of PNP or NPN transistors or MOSFETs. We may apply it to recent set pins, you know, whatever. So it would be nice to also have a low signal at the same time. And to accomplish this feat, we need only one more single thing, a CMOS hex inverter, just a, just a not chip with six of them in there. It'll cost you eight cents. And we do this. We just hook up all six of the inverter pins to this. In my video about TTL and CMOS intermediate voltage and so forth, I basically showed that you could apply a signal, like if you, if you apply, let's say, a signal like this to a CMOS inverter, you're going to get kind of a, kind of a wavy, uh, I can't draw, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to resemble that capacitor charging curve because it's going to be flat high and flat low, but as it switches between high and low and low to high, the pins act as amplifiers. It's all about the transistor operating in cutoff, saturation, or active. When you are in between saturation and cutoff, the pin of the inverter is an amplifier. So you're going to get a curve. You're going to get an amplified curve, so it's going to be sharper and closer to the rails, but not sharp enough. But what happens is, if you amplify, you start with something like this, and then it gets sharper and sharper and sharper as you amplify again. And you can do this nice and easy by just plugging it into itself. You've got six inverters on the chip. So you just take the signal and plug it in, plug it in, plug it in after the fifth one, because you, like I said, the hex inverter is standard. You're going to have six. So after five inversions, you have an inversion digitally. After six inversions, it's not inverted. It's just three buffers, basically. Three buffer operations. So what happens is your input signal is this, your output signal is this. Because you can't just plug it into a Schmidt trigger because the inputs of the Schmidt trigger are going to be the same way. Not as bad, but yeah. There's, it's not... First of all, it's not going to be as easy, but I mean, you could use a Schmidt trigger, but honestly, this is this is easier. And also you get the inverted. That's the other thing. If you plug it into a Schmidt trigger, then if you need the inverted signal, you have to invert it. But here we get the sharpening and we get the inversion by just taking the output there. So it's one chip to do both. So honestly, there's no reason to use a Schmidt trigger for this, even if your Schmidt trigger does generate a fast enough signal. And I'll show you this on the oscilloscope in a minute. And I'm going to do future videos about how to use this boot up signal to actually initialize chips, like put a pattern in a shift register. But I can tell you right now some very brief ones, like for example, if you have a chip that you want to be reset, you can apply this signal so that let's say low is reset or high because you've got both. So let's say let's say it's an active low reset. So you put this on the chip and then once everything stabilizes, it's it's in the reset state. And then when this boot up signal finally switches high, then the reset pen is held high thereafter and there's no resetting. And then your microcontroller, like if you have an Arduino plugged in, that one has a clock in it. So all you have to do is wait. You know, you put this in here, you know how long it's going to take, half a second, a second. So all you do is you just wait for half a second or a second. And if, if you have an Arduino, it's probably running the bootloader when power comes on. So it's probably going to be that anyway. You probably don't have to do anything because it's running its bootloader while your timer is running. Another thing you can do is power a transistor. Maybe there's something that you want to be blocked off during boot, but you want it to be turned on thereafter. So you could apply this signal to the base of an NPN or something. And until it goes high, the NPN is cut off. And then when it goes high, then it turns on. Or you could do a PNP or anything else. And you could have something powered during boot up 
and then it's cut off from there on. So when this goes high to the base of a PNP, then it's cut off and there's no waste because you've got high and high across the base emitter or emitter base, so it's not even conducting. The only waste is this, which is one milliwatt. And we're using a CMOS chip here, so there's almost nothing. So this whole thing isn't even going to use, you know, two milliwatts. And if you wanted to, you could make this resistor bigger and that resistor bigger. So the last thing to mention is the boot up. One reason you want this boot up, because because remember, your chips are being powered by the power coming on, the, the resistor has to start conducting, the diodes, everything. Everything in the whole system has to get power and settle before it makes sense. If you have an oscillator, this as soon as the oscillator has power, it's it might just start with minuscule undetectable oscillations and get bigger, or it might just be like blah, 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 and then settle down. So another thing about this is don't treat it as a clock signal. When this goes low to high or high to low, that is not intended to be a clock signal because when you turn this on, when you flip the power switch, first of all, everything's going to be goofy and it can switch multiple times. You want to think about this as a constant signal, not a clock signal. But the other thing is a power switch bounces. So when you flip your power switch, and yes, physical power switches are still a thing. And how are you going to debounce it? You're going to you're going to put it through a circuit. That circuit just turned on too. So you know, you could you could have a whole nother one of these to debounce your power switch, but why? <laughs> We've already got one. So just use this as a constant signal. But power switches are a real thing, and your entire system is basically like, imagine you have a, a, somebody pressing the elevator button, like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. That happens at the start of your circuit. So this thing is going to switch like 50 times. But after the first microsecond or two, it's going to settle. And it's going to be nice and low, and then... And that's what you count on. It'll make more sense, perhaps, as I do examples, like initializing a shift register. But it allows everything to settle, your oscillator to start, resetting your parts, and then it cuts off. So I'm going to show you now the timing aspect of this, how to sharpen up the signal enough using just this inverter chip. If you have any suggestions or requests about how to use this kind of thing to initialize any anything, give me give me the hardest problem you've got of how to take any sort of chip or sub-circuit and initialize it on boot up without a microcontroller. That's actually a series of videos I'm working on, how to do things that normally you'd use a microcontroller for with no microcontroller, including multi-step. It'll be cool. So if you have a request, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just do the ideas I've already thought of. But now let me show you the oscilloscope. So here I have a power switch. I'm gonna use five volts. Power switch is currently off. So the only thing connected is ground. So that's just reading low. I've got it sized so that high is at the top and low is at the bottom just to make it easy. So this is the power switch and everything is powered by this. The source of my JFET, the top of the RC network and the inverter chip are all powered by this power switch. And when I flip it, the whole thing gets power. Nothing stays on when the switch is low. So I've got a 27K resistor here. I've got a depletion JFET here in type. I've got a standard signal diode there. My capacitor is 10 nanofarads, and here is my charge resistor, which you, you're probably going to have 10 mega ohm resistors, so you use two in series. I've actually got five for 50 mega ohms, because when you have your charging curve and it gets amplified, it's not going to wait until it's 4.99 volts to say hi. It's going to amplify at some point. And so when I had 20 mega ohms, I was only getting like, you know, 20 or 30 percent of a second. I wanted to increase that. So with 50 mega ohms, I'm getting nearly half a second, roughly half a second, which I've decided is enough, <clears throat> partly because I ran into 10 mega ohm resistors. But half a second is still plenty. So 50 mega ohms for the charge resistor, and then a CD4069 inverter. It's just a CMOS hex inverter, probably going to cost you 8 cents. Unless you buy one, then you got to pay <laughs> for a giant box with one chip in it. But I bought you know, a sleeve of 100 is really cheap. So I've got the two oscilloscope signals are going to measure the fifth and the sixth output. So the entire chip from one side to the other is just invert, 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 invert. After the fifth inversion is one signal, after the sixth is another. And right now, of course, they're both nothing. So now let me zoom in and you can just focus on the screen. Now, if you have trouble telling yellow and green apart, there's not really anything I can do to help you because it's not like I can reprogram this oscilloscope. So you'll just have to take my word for it. So if I turn the power on, you'll see that 
it was a green line on the top and a yellow line on the bottom, and then they flipped. And then when I turn the power off, it drains down. So I turn the power on green and then yellow. So just focus your eye on the top, green and then yellow. Focus your eye on the bottom, yellow and then green. So as soon as everything settles, I turn the power on, everything bounces and settles, and then one is high and one is low because it's going through the five and six inverters. And then after the charge time, which is about half a second, it flips. So, so that's the operation. If you see it wiggle, this is just me touching the board because the wires are loose. The circuit is fine. It's just, it's a breadboard, you know, with a crappy little switch in it. And then we can see the drain. So first thing is I want to show you the drain time. So if I set my trigger here and single, it might be able to show me the drain. And so here, now, here's the thing. Let me just mention this. This is going to be a terrible way to demonstrate the draining because I'm, I've got a 10 mega ohm probe from my oscilloscope plugged in, which is, it's going to drain the capacitor, so it's not timing right. Plus it's switch bouncing and everything. So what I had was my usual technique of I buffer it with an op amp because an op amp has an like you know giga ohms tera ohms of input impedance. So I would measure the signal on the oscilloscope after passing through an op amp that I had externally powered, and that worked fine. But I could not get the timing fast enough. It was taking 15 microseconds. 15 microseconds is a very long time for what I'm trying to do. And then I had my brain turn on and I went to the data sheet of my op amp and it's like, oh, you know, five microseconds on the order of is its maximum transition time. So it's like, oh, that's as fast as the op amp could go. So I had to switch. <laughs> I had to switch so that I'm measuring directly with the oscilloscope. So when I turn the power off and it begins to drain, you can see the switch bouncing as it drains, but then here we can basically just time it. The divisions are 200 microseconds, so one, two, three, four, five. This is about a millisecond, so you can see from here to here, you know, it's going to be like one, one and a half milliseconds, so that's at least a good enough demonstration that the discharge time is correct. I don't feel like hooking in the op amp and showing you that. But now the important part, the charge. So if I trigger on turning it on, here we can see a terrible mess. Let me even zoom out. Uh, that's about as terrible as that one's going to get. Let's try again. Yeah. So this is capturing the initial switch when power is first applied. And this is what I mean by don't treat this as a clock signal. Don't treat it as a pulse because the switch is bouncing. Oh, here we go. There we go. If I zoom out like that, it's going to show it better. So this is what's happening on charge. I've got my switch bouncing. I've got everything flipping around. It's basically cutting and uncutting power to the chip, but the divisions are 100 microseconds. So this is only about a 300 microsecond span. The charging is going over 500-ish, 400-ish milliseconds. This is why. This initial point, because after this, you can see it's nice. It's nice and smooth, but... At this point where it's first applied, it's terrible. Even if I had, you know, some sort of non-physical switch, you know, you're going to have this, the, the putting the battery contacts in or flipping the power switch, whatever, is going to bounce. It's going to be ugly. So that's that problem. But if I switch the source again, I can show you the important thing. And here I've paused again, if you can see the colors, the top is green, the bottom is yellow. And then here the top is yellow, the bottom is green. Looks real nice and sharp. And we're again, right now we're on the scale of 200 microseconds and we can't see a division. So let me zoom in and you can start to see, and then let me do a new capture. So it's maximum resolution. So this is when the timing finishes. Can you see, like you, you can see the slope down, you can see the slope up, but Right now, the divisions are 50 nanoseconds. So from here, one, two, three, and we're basically at the bottom. 150 nanoseconds. That is basically the limit of this chip. By putting it to this many inversions on just one single chip, I looked at the data sheet, on the order of like 100 nanoseconds or so is the limit. This is actually switching pretty much as fast as this chip can actually switch from an RC timer that is charging over nearly half a second. We're getting nanosecond transition times. Perfect. And this is why it works. Now what happens, dare say, if I don't do quite as many inversions? So instead of taking the signal after inversion five and six, let's back up and drop two gates. And now you can see all I've done, it's, it's exactly the same. All I've done is reduce the number of inversions. And you can see 
The green signal is the inverted one because it's going from high to low when the charging finishes. This one, the non-inverted, is going low to high, which means it has an additional inversion. So the green is being inverted three times, and the yellow is being inverted four times because I've cut out two gates. And so that's why every single time, this is a great example, every single time you put a signal through another one of these gates, it amplifies it more. The timing here is 100 nanoseconds, so now the yellow is taking like 150 to 200 nanoseconds, and this green is like, you know, half a microsecond at this point. What if I back up another two? So before I even try to capture its single, I want you to just watch the screen as I switch this right now. Watch it very closely. You could actually see with your human eyes the green go from top to bottom. Let's do it again. Here's the discharge. It's instantaneous. You could see a ghost of lines because of the frame rate of the screen, but it was instantaneous. But when I switch it to high, you can actually see it go new. Now, let's capture it. And now I have to zoom out. That looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Let's capture it again. This is gross. Could this get more gross? This is your transition. I have, if I, if I do this, if I zoom like this, what even is this? What is this goofiness? But the divisions are 500 microseconds. So this right here, this span alone is an entire millisecond, a millisecond now of just this thing desperately clawing its way towards the high. While this one, the green, which is only going through a single inversion, basically not even amplified hardly at all, is just strolling leisurely, like sliding down the slope, just rolling down after that cheese. Let's zoom out even more. And there you can really see it. This is what happens if you don't do that amplification. Now we actually see just how slow this yellow curve is. And not only that, but we see bouncing. Now it's actually letting bouncing through. Before, it was amplifying so hard that the bouncing was completely immaterial of the power supply. Like when I turned the switch off, it would like briefly reconnect a couple times as it bounced. And now we can even see that. But if I go back and I measure, there we go. There is our nice square. Zoom in, zoom in, zoom way in and recapture for resolution, and there it is. 50 to 150 nanoseconds. That's all you gotta do. A few gigantic resistors you're gonna have a million of because when you buy an assortment box, you never have any use for the 10 mega ohms, or you could use eight mega ohms and just stack them together and, and make, you know, 50 mega ohms or more of resistance. One single reasonable size resistor, one little capacitor, one JFET, one diode, and one inverter chip, a couple milliwatts, and there you go. That's it. And you have your boot up signal. I hope you can see how incredibly useful this is. And if you can't, I hope you see how useful it is after a few more of these videos. So go ahead and tell me what your favorite chip is to use with your Arduino or whatever. And tell me what you want it to do on boot up and I'll make it do it. Until then, I'll be seeing you.